The History Things Podcast is brought to you by TR Historical, your one-stop shop for all your historical fan gear needs. Visit trhistorical.com and use the promo code HISTORYTHINGS to receive 10% off your next purchase. Thanks for listening. Now let's start the show. Are you ready? Welcome everyone to the History Things Podcast, brought to you by TR Historical, your one-stop shop for all your historical fan gear needs. I'm Matt Borders, and with me as always is my co-host, fellow park ranger and public historian extraordinaire, Pat McGuire. Well, How's it going, buddy? Uh, it's good, man. I'm uh, happy to be back down here in the War Department studios. Uh, kind of feeling like a bunker right now, since all the uh, renovation and uh, construction happening in the basement. But I'm I'm happy to be here nonetheless. Big things happening here around the War Department. Yeah, you know, if you if you walk down here, you'd be like, "What the hell is happening?" But what's happening <laughs> is I am finishing the basement with the help of a lot of my friends, um, some of whom you know, some of whom you don't know. Uh, but what I'm turning this place into is essentially a creative headquarters for all things history, things podcast, some of the things I do in my own time, a huge space for my children, things like that. And it requires two by fours, framing, electric, all this stuff. And right now we're in the midst of it. So Matt and I need to take a break from that because Matt has been helping. You, you like drywall, right? At this point, it's your favorite task. <laughs> Muddy and I'm all right with. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're taking a break from that because we just, you know, it'll, it'll rack your brain. But um. You know, I'm excited, man, because we're, we're here to focus on us as storytellers once more. You know, we did this earlier this season. It was uh, a story I told about a, a steamship that sank off the coast of the Outer Banks. And now we're here for you today, my friend. What are we talking about? Well, the uh, bunker idea is appropriate because we're actually <laughs> heading into the Western Front. But instead of being on the ground, as we've done with two of our previous guests, both with um, the 151st French infantry and, of course, the, the Battle of the Somme, both of those programs really diving deep into the fighting on the ground. We're going to be heading into the air. Ooh, looking up. That's right. Uh, the first air war is really what got me into World War One around 2006. I was looking for something new to research in history. I had been just burned out after six years of really hitting it hard with my degrees in, for American Civil War, and so I was yeah. looking at different aspects to look into, and I'd always been drawn to the First World War, but didn't know really where to start with it. So I decided to take a little piece. Uh, in this case, I decided to start looking into the Air War. Right. It's the first conflict, well, not quite the first conflict that has uh, aspects of aerial elements. Things in the sky. Right, exactly. But we're going to get into all that today because, of course, knowing me, we'll get some context. But I did want to talk <laughs> to you guys about the first air war, the men in flying machines, World War One. You know, I think it's interesting, Matt, because we definitely spend so much time focusing on the mud and the barbed wire and the things happening in the trenches during the First World War. Um, it's it's interesting how it it in a way kind of seems like the air war is an afterthought. You're like, oh yeah, things do happen in the sky, and I think most people only know one pilot by name in most regards and they make delicious pizza today well i'm gonna make that <laughs> joke too actually all right so we'll get there we'll save it we'll save it but uh, i'm excited for this because i also agreed where you said that you know to to break off a piece of this super complicated you know geopolitical military affair you know it's the only real way to begin digesting it and that's what i did you know i bit off a unit to right uh follow through the duration of the war you know i don't have a a general campaign understanding for everything yet, but I can tell you what this unit does from start to finish on the Western Front. So I'm excited today, Matt. Excellent. Take us to the skies. Is, should I play the Top Gun music? No, <laughs> not not Danger yet. Zone. Um, with this, I developed this program actually for the Centennial a few years back, and All was right. able to give it a few times at at a few different talks and things. 
So we're going to dive right in now um, because you actually touched on one of the things that I generally do when bringing an audience into this topic is usually with the Great War, we tend to think of the trenches, the wire, of course, the terrible casualties, and the mud, the mud, and the mud. So much mud. Yep, exactly. And all the images we have there are actually Passchendaele shots because that's probably the muddiest of campaigns or the ones that most people think of. That just to tell you, whenever this show gets to Passchendaele as a subject matter, like that place was so destroyed and muddy and quagmire-ish. Is that a word? I guess quagmire-ish. I'm going to make it a word. Giggity. Um, But it is, it's one of those like in a war that kind of looks like that almost everywhere. It stands out for looking like that amongst all the rest of it. So exactly. If you're thinking of the first world war, you're likely thinking of Passchendaele. Yep. So you actually began to touch on it already, Pat. So the, the air war for the first world war in popular memory tends to resolve, revolve around two things, either Snoopy himself. Oh, I forgot about the man <laughs> himself. Hunting the Red Baron or the Red Baron. Unfortunately, usually folks <laughs> thinking of a pizza company. They, they make good pizza. Well, they make good pizza, but their their <laughs> logo or their icon looks nothing like Rick Toffin. Rick Toffin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Not even maybe, a little bit. Maybe some licensing issues. <laughs> Who knows? It's just the guy with the red scarf, but delicious pizza nonetheless. I forgot the Snoopy connection. That's a good one, Matt. Yep. Now, before we dive into World War I itself, let's look at, back a little bit at some of the early uses of air power. And, of course, if we're looking at early uses of air power before the age of flying machines, of actual like, self-propelled flight. Yeah, like motors, right? Right. What are we talking about? We're talking about balloons. Exactly. Yep. Yes. And the first military organization to recognize the importance of aerial reconnaissance was actually the French uh, and the French Aerostatic Corps which was formed on April 2nd, 1794. Wow. Captain Jean-Marie Joseph Cotel. Eat your heart out, Thaddeus Lowe people. It's way before him. And I'm sure I just butchered that uh, captain's name. Now, this is going to be utilized during the French Revolutionary Wars. And specifically, we're going to see that used at the Battle of Fleurs on June 26th, 1794. The balloon was actually dragged to the plane of Fleurs by about 20 soldiers, and it flew for days before the battle. The battle, uh, during the battle, I should say, it remained aloft for nine hours, dropping messages on Austrian movements to the staff below and sending out messages by semaphore or flags. Whoa. Okay. So, That's pretty advanced. Yeah, they're trying to do some real communication, some real battlefield communication with the balloons. I also feel like, Matt, we're in our third season here. If people are expecting us to nail French pronunciations, like you, <laughs> you, I don't know why you still have these expectations. If people are expecting us to be serious all the time or do the French thing, it's just, we are who we are. We're human beings. People relax. There you go. Now... The French are going to win an unexpected victory, in part due to being able to react to the Austrian movements at Fleurs. What are the Austrians doing? Are they just like, we? they they can see that, obviously. Are they shooting at it? Are they going like... I think it was, I think it was too far away from the lines for them to really do anything about it. Uh, Obviously, all of the paintings and stuff, it's featured kind of prominently, but from what I understand... They're from the reading, it was actually back away from the line. Sure, but that would just be infuriating to see something, and you're like, that's obviously being used to our disadvantage, and right. we can do nothing about it. Right, exactly. Curses. Now, the next time we really see the French aerostatic corps being utilized would be the Battle of Mons uh, on August 29th, 1795. Following the sec- success of the first balloon at A second balloon was actually developed, or a second balloon company was developed. This company saw action at Mons, where the French forces had the city under siege. Now, we would see it used the following year as well, at the Battle of Würzburg on September 3rd, 1796. The French attack what they thought was an isolated Austrian division. However, misty weather prevents the balloon company from seeing the Austrian reinforcements and the French are defeated with the balloon company the La Intrepid captured. The balloon Ooh. remains to this day in a museum in Vienna. So was there like some reverse uh, engineering done? Did they develop their own balloon? That's a good question. I actually do not have any information if All the right. Austrians decided to do their own balloon core due to this. 
but uh, that balloon still exists. They were happy to display it. Yep, exactly. <laughs> it's a, a capture of war, and it really starts to show some of the limitations that sure. we're going to see with aerial reconnaissance, and those we'll see um, come up again in later conflicts. I love that some of the battles you've been dropping by name are like, every time you say it, I'm like, oh, first war, no, no, we're in the 1700s. It's like <laughs> Fleurs, uh, Mons, those are both battles the, that you'll hear in the 19-teens. Yep. Now, the Battle of the Nile was fought on August 1st through the 2nd, 1798. Cotel is attached to Napoleon's Egyptian campaign because, yes, Napoleon, Napoleon was in Egypt. Yes, he was. <laughs> Upon arrival, the balloon and equipment were left on the ship, which was then destroyed during the Battle of the Nile by the British Navy. So that's going to basically do in most of the uh, aerostatic corps. On January 15, 1799, the aerostatic corps was disbanded by the French Directory. So it's basically done after most of its equipment's destroyed at the Nile. I know part of the Nile is absolutely massive, and that's why the British Navy is able to get in there in the way I'm likely thinking, but there's also a part of me that just imagines the British Navy in the way of Monty Python's Spanish Inquisition, just somehow the British Navy just shows up. It's more at the mouth of the yeah, Nile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's like. I know it's like it's, it's there, but just the way, the way you, I was envisioning it while you were describing it, I was like, they're everywhere. They those, are those everywhere. Those pesky British naval officers. Nelson, <laughs> Nelson is smiling. Well, and Nelson's there, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, Accidentally cool. One that you are much more familiar with, though, Pat, is, of course, the American Civil War. That's right. Now... Thaddeus Lowe, or Professor Thaddeus Lowe, is mostly self-educated. He's the father of military aerial reconnaissance in the United States. He had been an avid learner, though not a particularly well-known student in his young life. And as a young man, he had assisted, or at a young age, I should say, he had assisted Professor Reginald de Kelfhoff on his chemistry lecture circuit. How does he become a professor if he's self-educated? Ah, that is more of an honorific being placed upon him by the press and his significant amount of fans. All right, because I was about to say, is this like some von Steuben where I just show up and tell you my title and names and you just accept it? Because who said you're a professor? Right. I think that's pretty much the situation. (laughs) The same guy that hates that I say Willie the Deuce probably hates that I just called him Tad Lowe. Ah, possibly. (laughs) Whatever. Now, with him going around on this lecture circuit with the chemistry professor, this is going to spark an interest in lighter-than-air gases and aviation in Thaddeus Lowe. By the 1850s, he was the country's premier balloon builder and lecturer on the topic. By 1859, Lowe was building a massive balloon, the City of New York, for a transatlantic flight. A practice flight in the smaller balloon Enterprise from Cincinnati, Ohio, to the East Coast was blown off course in April of 1861, landing in South Carolina. Now, Pat, why is that a problem for Thaddeus Lowe? Um, Because all hell is breaking loose in South Carolina in April of 1861. Uh, That is Confederate South Carolina at this point. That's exactly right. And Thaddeus Lowe, Professor Lowe, is going to be captured by South Carolina state forces and held for a brief time before he is eventually released with his balloon and shipped back north to Washington, D.C. They gave him the balloon back? They gave him his balloon back. Uh, Basically, his copious amounts of fans, because he does have fans across the country for his lectures and his demonstrations, uh, impart upon South Carolina authorities that he's not a spy. He is a yet. scientist. Yet. Now, he will be involved with the federal <laughs> government shortly, but he is not at this point, and so they do allow him to return to Washington. All right. That's pretty interesting. It is. Now, Thaddeus Lowe is actually going to miss the first Battle of Bull Run. There was another. There was actually a couple of different um, aeronauts who were trying to get the contract to be the balloonists for the federal government and the federal military, and he was outbid. Uh, but those aeronauts are not able to make the Battle of First Bull run either. We will see, of course, the period that Thaddeus Lowe is probably most famous for is the Peninsula Campaign in the right. spring of 1862. Right. Uh, he is going to fly both of his balloons repeatedly, both the Intrepid and the Constitution would be flown during that period. And 
we would even see him again at another campaign that we've studied a bit around Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg! That's right. I I gotta stop doing that every time you say it. (laughs) But uh, Lowe is at Fredericksburg. It doesn't particularly help um, his presence there during the campaign, and, and that tragedy unfolds as we know it does. Yeah. Thanks, John Reynolds. <laughs> now, his final campaign and his final um, work with the United States military is actually during Chancellorsville. Okay. Now, you know that campaign as as well, Pat. What do you? What's the terrain like down there? I mean, it's heavily wooded down in the uh, sort of Spotsylvania Chancellorsville uh, wilderness. In fact, that's one of the reasons why they call it the wilderness is because it's just wood and swamp and just every foliage you can imagine. That's exactly uh, right. It's a miserable place to to have a normal walk through, much less fight and campaign in the middle of it. Yep, that's exactly right. And in fact, the uh, low balloons will not be of much use during the Chancellorsville campaign. Because they can't see through the canopy? Because they can't see through the canopy. That's exactly. Right. They can see the smoke coming up. They can hear the noise of the fighting, but they really can't determine who's moving where or doing what. I wonder, like, so they weren't able to tell, like, at all, like, get glimpses of anything or, like, following the dust would be smart or the smoke of a bivouac or something like that. Like, were they, they weren't effective at all? Not particularly. Not, nothing that I've read really shows them being particularly effective during the Chancellorsville campaign. Sure. Now, of course, we've got a really big campaign that's about to blow up in the summer of 63, but Thaddeus Lowe's not involved at all. In fact, the United States Aeronautic Corps is disbanded just before the Gettysburg campaign. Interesting move. Yep. Uh, Thaddeus Lowe gets in a fight over rank and his payment, to be perfectly honest. And when the federal government is not willing to pay his his rates or give him the control that he's looking for over his own balloons he takes his balls or in this case his balloons and goes home he definitely takes his balls and goes home uh what kind of rank is he looking at or does he hold a rank at this point uh if i remember correctly he did have the rank of first lieutenant and i think he was being bossed around by a captain and he didn't like that Mm. was one of the issues Felt like he knew more than the captain. Oh, he most certainly knew more than the captain <laughs> in sure. regards of aer- aeronaut, uh, aeronautics. He now should, he should be general of the aeronaut corps. General of the. I aeronaut mean, if he's the smartest balloonist there is, why is he subordinate to anybody? Because it's all being caught under the bureaucracy of the army. Sure, sure. I mean, I get that part. It's just, it's like you know. If you wanted to do this right, he's absolutely the smartest guy ever. It's not like you know during any nuclear fission projects we were like hey genius you know physicists um get me coffee (laughs) right (laughs) good point (laughs) like what now while this is going on this period of the late 19th century we do see some use of balloons also in europe going on particularly the franco-prussian war during the wars of empires franco-prussian war 1870 to 71 the culmination of Otto von Bismarck's attempts to form a unified German state towards the end of this very brief war, Paris is going to be besieged. And what we're going to see during the siege of Paris is at least 67 wow. balloons will be utilized to evacuate 110 people from the city. Oh, wow. An airlift. Yep. And bring in about 24,000 pounds, bring in and out about 24,000 pounds of mail. Unreal. Yeah, so they're they are, it's an actual airlift. They're really utilizing these things. Now, Paris is going to be besieged on September 19th until the end of the war on January 28th, 1871. And with that, that's basically going to wrap up the balloon for Central Europe. I wonder real quick if, like, what kind of, do you know what kind of balloons we're looking at? Are they, are they huge? Are they taking cars? Like, I mean, they're not huge. They're single balloons, very similar to a modern hot air balloon with a single basket underneath it. So we're putting like 10 people in them at a time? At most, I would say. That's unbelievable. Hmm. Also, I never want to get in a hot air balloon. My mother has. I just, they just seem so unpredictable. (laughs) <laughs> well, they are. They are based on the winds in a lot of ways. And because I'm just, you know, who I am and just ridiculous, uh, the reason I won't do it is because uh, former NFL wide receiver Dante Stallworth got electrocuted. I think he lived. 
But uh, he definitely was in a hot air balloon that hit some power lines, and I was like, no thanks. Oh, well, yeah. Nope. Got to watch out for the lines. I want to be able to actively steer that thing. (laughs) Now, we do see the British military utilizing balloons in the very late 19th and into the early 20th century with the Boer War, which lasts 1899 to 1902. This is technically the second Boer War. (laughs) Um, what's going to happen is the British empire is pitched against allied South African colonies and their Dutch colonists. And the balloon is going to be used on these open landscapes. We're going to have three, what the British military referred to as sections of balloons, which is about a hundred of these things in a section. Well, total. Okay. I was about to say that's like 300 balloons. No, (laughs) Uh, we're going to have about a hundred balloons total with the British military down in South Africa uh, during the Boer War, the Second Boer War, which would be utilized to watch these vast open landscapes. The open terrain is going to be a huge benefit to these balloons and would be utilized for eventually running down the Boers. All right. Uh, I like that you kind (laughs) of specified it's the Second Boer War. One day we will touch the British Empire subject and you will just see how many of these wars they repeat and repeat and repeat. But not today. Not today, today. We are flying over France. Well, we're not there yet. We're not flying. I guess we were well, flying over France earlier. We are going to be getting into flyers now because in 1903, something that you're very familiar with, yes. Pat, we are going to have down there at Kitty Hawk, the Wright Flyer. Absolutely. First successful flight, December 17th, 1903. The Wright Flyer flew for 12 seconds for a distance of 120 feet. Four flights were taken over the course of that day, each progressively longer, the fourth being for 59 seconds and 852 feet. So almost a full minute and over 800 feet for the Wright brothers. Now, Orville and Wilbur Wright, they had, neither of them, I should say, graduated high school, but both showed an incredible curiosity and drive. Their projects together included a local paper and a bicycle company, which is probably what a lot of folks remember them for, other than the flyer. Uh, Wilbur began seriously looking into aeronautics in 1899, and Orville joins him in his research soon thereafter. Now, what's interesting about the Wrights, we oftentimes think about these these two intrepid young men, brothers, and how they're uh, experimenting, and it's all for the science, and they will aggressively defend their experiments in court. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very much so. Oh, yeah, it's theirs. Yes, and they are very, very um, attached to their flyer and their system of doing things. Now, we're going to touch on that in a moment. Yeah, because they have a whole back and forth with the Army over, yes. like, planes that they're manufacturing for them, and it doesn't always go smoothly or well. And right. It's contentious, for sure. Yep, exactly. And, in fact, this new science that they have really helped bring to the forefront, uh, the idea of aerial experiment is going to form into the 1907 Aerial Experiment Association, which would include such luminaries as Alexander Graham Bell, Tom Selfridge, which we're going to talk about in a moment, Glenn Curtis of the Curtis Airplane Designer. The organization, according to Dr. Bell, was a, quote, cooperative scientific association, not for gain, but for the love of the art and doing what we can to help one another. Now, the Wrights never joined the Aerial Experiment Association and sued Curtis when he tried to profit on airplane designs that used the Wright, the Wright brothers' control ideas. They're like, screw your charity for all mentality. This is ours. Well, and because of some of the big big wigs that are in that organization, I'm thinking particularly Glenn Curtis, uh, the AEA, as it became known, was disbanded in 1909. The uh, ER, as it's called. <laughs> Nobody ever called it. The, the, <laughs> the Aerial Experiment Association, uh, Association, the scientific organization yeah. for flight experimentation, lasts less than two years. Wow. Is that the same Selfridge that's like the Macy's of England for a while? Like the, the famous uh, Ah, retailer? good question. I don't know if he's related, but he, but let's talk a little bit about First Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge because he is United States military. Specifically, right. he's Army, the U.S. Signal Corps, and it was a founding member of the Aerial Experiment Association. Selfridge was an enthusiastic aeronaut and volunteered to go up with Orville Wright following the initial Fort Myers demonstrations that were done by the uh, Wright brothers on September 3rd, 1908. 
on September 17, 1908, Selfridge goes up as the Army's first official observer. At 100 feet, the flyer's propeller splits, sending it into an out-of-control dive. The resulting crash would badly injure Orville Wright and fractured Selfridge's skull. Oof. Now, unfortunately, he will be the first United States military man killed in a aerial accident. He dies that evening. Mm. Now, with all of this early experimentation going on at the beginning of the 20th century on this side of the pond, let's take a quick look over at Europe again, because we do have, in October 1908, Sam Cody is going to fly in Great Britain. Now, Sam Cody is an American entrepreneur and aeronaut who became the first man to fly in Great Britain. Uh, He does... Cody is a stage name. Uh, he actually refers to him that as to kind of tie himself into Buffalo, Buffalo Bill Cody, even right. though he's not actually related to him. But a year after Sam Cody's flight in England on his very rickety-looking device, we're going to see Louis Bellarude. Is that not the right flyer? That is not the right no, flyer. No, I know, but, like, is that not the right flyer? Look at it. I mean, everybody looking at this presentation right now is going to see that and be like, are you sure that's not Getty Hawk? No, it is not. I know, but like the plane looks so similar. And you can even see the little Union Jack that he's got flying off the back of it there. Rule Britannia! (laughs) So like I said, a year after Cody does his flight in Great Britain, we're going to have Louis Bellarut of France cross the English Channel from Calais to Dover. Now, he did this in a monoplane of his own design, the Type 11. Prior to World War I, he became one of the largest aircraft producers in Europe. And here's his Type 11 right there shortly after he's landed in Dover. Ooh. You can see him talking to the local authorities there. He's very famous now. <laughs> They're like, what have you done? He's like, I have flown. <laughs> That's right. Now, early military use of motorized aircraft, we're actually going to see not just in World War I, but in a couple of the conflicts that occur before the First World War. These smaller uh, smaller wars, oftentimes we don't hear about here in the United States, but they are going to have some sway on what's going to happen with the air war. I'm wondering if it's because we're not directly involved. That's usually why we don't hear about things in this country. Sure, and I think that's probably true. Um, There was, of course, some coverage of them in the newspapers, but it's not something we really get in the schools these days. The Italian-Turkish War of 1911 to 1912. Oh, yes, very familiar. (laughs) Very familiar with that one. We're going to see the first instances of planes being used for reconnaissance and light aerial bombing. That's a bird. That is a German Taub, which actually does mean dove. That is a bird. (laughs) It does look like a bird. (laughs) Now, the war will see the annexation of Libya by the Italians and spurred the First Balkan War shortly thereafter. But real quick, the first aerial bombing does occur on November 1st, 1911. Now, what we have here is actually an aerial bombing being done by some Zeppelins, and it is now believed by many historians of air history, if you will, that this is a doctored photograph. Of the Zeppelin? Of the Zeppelins and the, and, and the little explosions underneath them. They think this is actually uh, basically two really images. early Photoshop. Yes, okay. two images. What are these Zeppelins made out of? Is it lead by chance? Ha, <laughs> <laughs> ah, cute. Yeah, there we go. Um, how are they dropping these bombs? Are they uh, they doing this World War One style or they have uh, some sort of... Uh, bomb doors, things like that. They're dropping them over the sides. (laughs) They're just dropping them like fish. Yep. Or if (laughs) maybe they have a a door in in the base of the, of the structure itself, but yeah, they're just dropping them. And then of course, a little propaganda image here as well from that uh, Italian Turkish war with the monoplane flying over the top of the, um, Turkish forces. He is buzzing the tower right there. (laughs) And apparently (laughs) scaring, uh, scaring everyone below him. There's like no, there's <laughs> around that propeller, there was no like obvious motor sign. So it's actually a stalled airplane. It's, oh, good. That plane's coming down. <laughs> <laughs> now, coming right off the heels of the Italian Turkish War would be the Balkan Wars of 1912 through 1913, the first mm. and second Balkan Wars. These minor conflicts in 1912 and 13 were the result of the first combined Balkan states pushing back against the Ottoman Empire. And then fighting amongst themselves for the spoils. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 
This is actually a Russian aircraft that's being utilized by the Balkans. Now, of course, World War I, Pat, begins in 1914, but I don't want to quite move into 1914 yet because I want to touch a little bit on what's happening here in the States before we go into World War I. Sure. Because during World War I, before the United States gets involved, we actually do have a little campaign going on That's over right. here. The Punitive Expedition. We're going south of the border. That's I don't right. know why I said it like fake Australian. We're not I'm, going to that country at all. Wasn't really sure why you did it that way either. <laughs> Just stuff happens here, guys. The Punitive Expedition. This is going to be on March 9th, 1916, Mexican revolutionary Francisco Pancho Villa attacks Columbus, New Mexico, and Camp Furlong to steal arms and embarrass the Mexican national government. Woodrow Wilson is president of the United States at the time and responds by sending General John Pershing and approximately 6,600 men into Mexico. This is a violation of Mexico's sovereignty, but Mm. we're hunting down the guy who has violated the United States' sovereignty as well. It's like an invasion, non-invasion. Like, hey, we're not here for you, Mexico, but like, since you're not getting this guy, we're getting this guy. That was the idea, yes. This is a revolutionary expedition, not even just in the air, but also on the ground. Yeah, there's mechanization everywhere in this expedition. That's right. And this expedition is going to have the use of the first aero squadron. And the first time we're going to see planes used in a military operation here in the United States. Now, unfortunately, the dry, dusty terrain of northern Mexico is going to be really harsh on these planes. They're going to be spending most of their time on the ground, either being serviced or being made to fly for brief periods, and they'll be used primarily for um, shuttling supplies, light light amount of supplies and things like that back and forth. Um, Apparently, there has been some that have suggested that they did attempt to mount a machine gun on one of these, uh, though it was a side-firing machine gun as opposed to through the propeller. We'll touch on that in a little bit. Yes, we will. So the punitive expedition in 1916 will be the first time the United States government, specifically the United States military, will use manned aircraft, actually machine-driven aircraft, in a combat situation. What's neat about this expedition is that it's one of the, you know, we were just touching on it a second ago, not just because of the the things happening in the skies above it. It's one of the most innovative expeditions going on at that time anywhere in the world because we also have uh, motorized vehicles as a part of this. You know, usually things have been done via horseback or horse-drawn carriage, things like that, wagons, artillery, everything pulled by literal horsepower. Mm -hmm. Uh, And now we've started to create that engine style horsepower hmm. and it's it's you know definitely driving part of this uh uh pershing expedition you know below the border and it's certainly um changing what warfare looks like on the western front so matt let's get into if you're ready are you ready to go above the uh the trenches absolutely let's, let's get, get in, above the trenches let's get into world war one itself so as you guys know july 28th 1914 Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. That is going to be the beginning of the First World War, and the countries would fall like dominoes into place over the next several weeks. This is going to be the catalyst for the 20th century, but at the beginning of this 20th century, at the end of the long century, the long 19th century, uh, there is a deep skepticism in all traditional military circles and leaders over the use of airplanes in the military. In fact, Ferdinand Foch, who would become Supreme Allied Commander for the, for the Allies, excuse me, um, would actually say at the beginning of the war, aviation is a good sport, but for the Army, it is useless. I just don't get that. Like, the concept of being able to see from above has already been proven to be beneficial, literally in multiple generations prior to this. Like, I don't, that just sounds arrogant. Well, and I think it's, again, military traditionalists falling back on what they know. Uh, Most agree that there is potential for reconnaissance in the air, but still feel that most scouting will actually be done by cavalry. Again, Um, these guys just don't want to let go. Well, and they don't know what's about to happen either. That's the thing we need to keep in mind. They don't know that Europe is going to be crisscrossed by hundreds of miles of trenches. They don't know that heavy artillery is going to become the dominating factor, at least not in the summer and early fall of 1914. That's right. 
So let's take a quick look at air power strength across Europe in 1914. So for Great Britain, we have 113 planes. Wow. 30, 30 of them are airworthy. <laughs> for the German Empire, it has 232 planes approximately. About 180 of those are airworthy. For France, approximately 138 planes. We don't know how many of those can actually fly. Vive la France. All of them fly. Austria-Hungary has approximately 110 planes. About 64 of those are airworthy. And for Russia, they've got about 150 planes and about 50 of those work. Wow. I'm actually surprised that Russia has that many that work. Um, I'm... Russia does a lot of really interesting uh, aeronautic designs and development before the world, First World War and into World War I. It's Tsiolkovsky um, are just doing some really interesting things with actually enclosed fuselages, sure. with multiple people being flown. But yes, uh, it's, it's not one of those things that we traditionally think of. Well, because we know their First World War experience is semi-disastrous just on the logistical front. They don't have enough rifles for all these guys. They have never heard of metal helmets, apparently. <laughs> you know, there's a lot. I'm, I'm obviously speaking in generalizations, but like that's, you know, logistics are a huge problem. <clears throat> excuse me, for the, uh, for the Russian army on the Eastern Front of the First World War. Right. And I was just, you know, shocked that they had not just an air power presence or an air war presence, but that many planes, mm -hmm. um, the Austria Hungary side of the wire looks stacked, uh, in the air at this point though, by comparison to everybody else, it looks like they have over 200 planes for Germany and Austria Hungary together. That's yeah. why yeah, I said that side of the wire, yeah. everybody, but yeah, it looks like they're, uh, they should be in position in the early parts to be in dominance. Uh, potentially. And we're going to talk about that. All right. So let's take a look at some airplanes. Ooh. For early airplanes, the British are, are really focusing on what's known as the British Experimentals, the BE-2A and BE-2B. They are sturdy, steady, and unarmed. BE-2B or not to be? Yes. These would be the first British planes sent to France after the outbreak of the war. Of course, a more famous name that's tied to these early British planes would be the Sopwith, and the Sopwith tabloid specifically was one of the first British planes used in combat. It's also an unarmed plane, but on October 9th, 1914, it would be a British tabloid that succeeded in dropping two 20-pound bombs on the Zeppelin sheds at Dusseldorf. So is their primary purpose at this point reconnaissance when they're being built? Correct. Okay. Yeah, these yeah. are... Almost exclusively reconnaissance at this point. They're sending, they're sending the guy up there, and they're like, "Hey, bloke, before you go, uh, here, take these," and it just hands them two bombs. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Take uh, your pictures, and then just you know, drop them. Little twenty-pound uh, bombs they can drop out the side of the plane. That's wild. Now we also have the Avro five hundred four, which was an early armed plane the first to strafe ground troops and the first British plane to be lost from ground fire. And you can see it's really starting to take on that classic biplane look at this point. Yeah. If you are, by the way, for our podcast listeners out there, this is a, an episode that's also going to have a, a compatible or a accompanying YouTube content. So if you want to see this presentation, Matt isn't just telling us a story. He's got his laptop open and we're actually looking at a slideshow uh, that goes with this. So if you want to see some of the things that we're talking about and not just listen to two weirdos in a basement, describe them, uh, head on over to uh, YouTube and listen to the uh, history things podcast there uh, and catch this episode. Now on the, as you would say, other side of the wire, we do have the German Tob, which again is that very bird looking plane. Look at those wings. Yep. It was developed in 1910 and was a very distinct swept wing design. Used from the opening of the war to about 1916, the Taub was slow and also unma uh, unarmed, uh, but could be a, both a single-seat design or, as this photo shows, a two-seater design. I'm just tripped out by the wings. I mean, I've never seen a set of wings on any experimental plane or, or whatever that look as much like a bird as these do. Oh, and the tail too. That's Absolutely. what I mean. Like everything about this plane, I get it. I mean, I get the, the name designation. It just, it's wild. It looks like an actual bird. Yep. Sure does. Now the Aviatik B1 was Germany's first recon biplane. And it too was probably used longer than it should have been from the start of the war until about 1916. But again, we're getting this very kind of classic biplane look starting yeah. to develop. 
Now, one that you'll be pretty familiar with would be the Fokker M5. Yep. Also known as an Eindecker because it has only one wing as opposed to a biplane. Uh, the basis of which would become Fokker's famous line of E-series fighters. Okay, the Eindecker fighters. Uh, the M5 came as both a single and two-seated scout plane as well. So, and that's actually Anthony Fokker in the in the pilot seat there. And we're going to talk about him in a little bit. For the French, we have such designs as the Vosin 3, and I love these because they're pusher aircraft. Something that we've got to remember is, is that there's no hard design for airplanes at this point, okay? We've got all these different types of airplanes, but there's still a lot of debate in the aeronautic community as to whether planes should be tractors, which means they're being pulled through the sky with a front-mounted engine, or what were known as pushers, having the engine behind you, and it would be pushing you through the sky. And the Vosin 3 is a pusher aircraft. Now, it's going to achieve the first air-to-air kill in the war. Uh, This pusher aircraft used a machine gun and later a rifle to shoot down a German aviatic B-1. The steel frame construction of the Vosin also gave it a surprising bomb load capacity for the early war, about 330 pounds. Ooh. Are we going to touch on what planes are being made out of at this point? A little bit. Okay. They're mostly being made out of wood and canvas, but right. again, these Vosins have a metal frame. So. That's why That's why that popped into my head. I was like, you know, we're kind of in the sticks and paper era mm-hmm. of airplanes, but that's a, a metal hold uh, fuselage, I guess. Right. Now, one of the most popular plane designs of the time, we've actually already heard about it, was the Belarut 11, again, Belarut, the same guy who flew across the channel, he's going to become an aircraft designer. And this aircraft was flown by France, Great Britain, and Italy for the opening years of the war. Looks extremely fragile, but it's a single wing design and was fairly reliable. It looks like a strong wind will crush it. (laughs) Or push it over. What is this guy's name? Belarut. Louis Belarut. Okay. Looks like Blario. That's why I was getting thrown, but we butcher French already established. That's true. We can just move on from that. That thing looks flimsy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Now, another pusher design was the Maurice Farman, uh, and the, specifically the S-11, which was an early recon bomber and used as a trainer for much of the war. And it's a big plane. None of these, like, that doesn't look like air. <laughs> you can't get that off the ground. <laughs> That thing looks bulky. Yes. If you're not going to go to YouTube and watch this, this is, this one is just a huge series of like, looks like sticks. Like it it looks like plywood two by fours and boxes and one big engine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the box wings because it does look like box kite wings. Yeah. Yeah. Do you're not kidding. This is the wild west. If we can get it off the ground, the design is good. Right. That's kind of how they're calling it. So let's look at some, Early combat. All right. And combat areas. So should I prepare myself by watching James Franco's movie before we get to this part of your presentation? (laughs) Well, I'm going to touch on Flyboys a little bit later because it's it's not good. But it's so good. But it's about (laughs) all we had at that time. No, you're right. All right. All right. right, We'll get to we'll get to pop culture uh, air war stuff later. I, I always like to touch on stuff like that. We'll get there. And. As we've already hinted at, reconnaissance is key initially for these planes. The Royal Flying Corps is going to be the precursor of the Royal Air Force that we know today. And the Royal Air Force does come out of the First World War, but it starts as the Royal Flying Corps. Right. Okay. It's established on April 13th, 1912, officially. Now, the Royal Flying Corps is going to be using recon planes successfully prior to and during the Battle of Mons and thereby saving the British Expeditionary Force from encirclement by the German First Army. And here's a, one of their squadrons with the Royal Flying Corps. Flying Corps sounds so much cooler than Royal Air Force. <laughs> now, what's going to happen is, is that on September 6th, French recon flyers had actually identified a massive gap between the First and Second uh, German armies closing in on Paris. This gap was exploited, and by September 8th, the German armies began to fall back and close up their lines. So, 
On the Eastern Front, both Germany and Russia used recon flyers prior to the Battle of Tannenberg. With Hindenburg listening to his flyers and Samsonov, the Russian general, not. This is going to lead to a crushing victory for the Germans at Tannenberg in 1914 and Samsonov shooting himself. Oh, like, like, um, and bear, what's the word? Like trying to do like a, what's, I'm thinking of the Japanese thing, but I don't think it, seppuku is the right shame. This guy just took his life in shame. He, he, he told his staff officers that he, how could he ever face the czar? Right. Czar Nicholas II. And he shoots himself. He goes off into the woods and shoots himself. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there was one air-to-air combat that occurred prior to the French shooting down an aviatic on October 5th, 1914. This was a ramming attack by Russian Captain Petri Nestrovov on August 25th, 1914. Nestrovov's plane was forced to crash. Nestrovov fell out and died the next day. How high up, you think? Oh, gosh. It doesn't even matter i mean you've got you've got planes that are traveling around 80 to 100 miles an hour it doesn't really matter how high they are if you if you're forced to crash like this one is and then fell fall out of it you're not going to be in a good way true 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 i don't know why that was my first question but i was like i wonder how high up he was (laughs) now one of the um aspects of the air war that's interesting is that people are fascinated by it from the beginning. Uh, We do have a lot of accounts of these flyers from all sides being followed by the newspapers and have writings on them. Uh, And and here's a little take from one of the newspapers at at the time from a German paper called Duel with, with British Machine. When the combatants had exhausted all their rifle and revolver ammunition, they blazed away with their very flare pistols, which made for very poor shooting. So they're shooting flare, flare guns at each say, other. I was going to say, they're like, I am out of ammo, and somebody's like, shoot your flare! <laughs> exactly. Now, you'd think if it hit them, that'd do some damage on these canvas aircraft. Yeah, it would destroy it. It would <laughs> likely light the entire thing on fire. Now, they laid their machines alongside. The humor of the situation struck von Lutzer, who's the lieutenant flying, so that he roared with laughter. The observers of the planes were also too amused to shoot straight. Neither got his mark. They so missed. this is all f- almost fun and games at the time. Yeah, we're shooting at you. Yeah, we're throwing stuff at you. But this is such a ridiculous situation that both sides kind of recognize that. And this is where this whole Knights of the Sky, sky sort of mentality is going to start to develop. Uh, yes, where they have this, like, admiration for each other because they're fighting some civilized new war over all the rest of the peasants of the old world in the mud. I don't know. I've always just... Pilots think they're better than everybody else. Have you ever seen Top Gun? Have you seen any era? They all act the same. But no, I definitely... Uh, uh, I get what you're saying. This is definitely where the fraternity of pilots is, you know, really starting to form because we we will see a number of notable sort of salutes and nods across the wire, you know, as things play out here during the war. So, you know, all jokes aside, the fraternity of pilots exists even today, you know, whether you're civilian or military, um, you know, it's it's just like anything, if you're in the the industry club kind of thing, and here we're watching the beginnings of it, because, you know, we don't have civilian air traffic at this point yet, right? We're not, we're not getting on planes and flying from New York to Washington. Right, exactly. We're we're just... Flying, fly, uh, flying, fly, fighting and flying for the military at this point. So this era of dueling in the sky has begun. We've already seen uh, that example from the newspaper there. Here's a little uh, promo picture, or not promo picture, but... Um, propaganda. Propaganda photo. Kind of feels like polo, the way you're describing it. It's like, you know, we're going out on the fox chase, or we're yep. playing polo. Yep. And, of course, they're experimenting a lot as well with how to be able to shoot straight and how to bring some firepower here. You can see here he's got what's probably a broom-handled Mauser, but he's actually developed a little brace for himself there. Steady the shot, old boy. Right. Now, aerial recon was moving beyond just tracking the enemy. Both sides began experimenting with artillery spotting as well during these early months of the war. 
first with balloons and later with planes, early radios, and even clock directional correction are also being experimented with. What's that one? I don't particularly know particularly well. All right. Well, that's something for us to get into someday here. It's a, it's a it's for correcting the angle of fire being done by the artillery pieces. Oh, so it's like uh, uh, spotting. Yeah, it's tied into spotting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, photography is a huge part of recon, and increasingly sophisticated cameras are going to be developed during this period. The larger plane-mounted cameras even had multiple lenses in them. So that's something that we kind of see going back to the box cameras of the Civil War era, when they would have multiple lenses of them for doing uh, CDVs. And, I mean, incredibly high-resolution images. Exactly. Well, now we're going to be <clears throat> developing that for planes. Bar bombers, bombers, nice. Bombers are also <laughs> going to start to be utilized at this time. They start as light, crude um, contraptions where they're throwing bricks and spikes and things like that and grenades, but they're going to have increasingly large ordnance in them. You said light, crude, so like more than just the pilot now? Like we have like a guy on the wing or stuff like that? Uh, usually the observer behind him okay. is the guy throwing things. Okay. So here's one of those box cameras. Yep. And here's an example of some types of aerial bombing. Now, what this particular thing is showing is very interesting because there is this whole period in the early war where they're literally dropping spikes on people. Like actual just metal spikes? They're about yay long. Like they're bolts? Yeah. With a sharpened end and sometimes little fins on them. You can still find them on eBay. They drop these by the... Thou if probably millions over Europe in the early years of the war. I didn't think that I had could I thought I'd discovered all of the truly gnarly, grisly things that have happened on the Western Front, but just <laughs> metal non explosive heavy metal bolts falling from the sky. Yep. And they would use these to pass over infantry formations, artillery batteries, not usually against other planes, even though they are dumping them out in the hundreds at the time. But yeah, absolutely. Those would jack people up so bad on the ground. Mm -hmm. It's actually thought to be, uh, you've probably heard of the, uh, I believe it's Angel of the Mons story. Yes. Where they, the BEF is uh, not only protected, but saved by angels firing arrows, um, kind of hearkening back to the Battle of Agincourt. While that is complete propaganda nonsense and no and, it's real life it <laughs> happened and was recognized as propaganda even at the time one of the ideas that how this might have been developed is because of all these, these freaking spikes everywhere oh my goodness that's just something new to think about in, in terms of the horrors of the war mm -hmm. my gosh so looking at some of the bombs themselves, though, there's a little handheld one there, probably a 20 pounder or something like that. But by the end of the war, we're going to have some very large ordnance. Uh, this is a R series Zeppelin bomber developed by Germany. We can see the enclosed fuselage there. Uh, but these are massive, massive planes. How many, like, not specific number, but like, I don't know, percentage? Do you think we're almost. 80%, 90% of the planes are open fuselage, like pilots are just sitting out of these little holes. Or, mm -hmm. So this is a semi-rare thing to have it enclosed in this manner. Right. That plane looks huge. It is huge. In fact, it's bigger than most World War II bombers. Really? Yeah, and that's because the engines don't have the strength of our, our bombers later in the years, and so it needs more lift from the wings. And okay. So most of these, heavy, what we would refer to as heavy World War I bombers, are bigger than World War II bombers. Some of these engines are like literally glorified car engines, right? <laughs> yeah. Like to start the war? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Daimler, Chrysler, Rolls-Royce, they all have big airplane well, elements. Yeah, but like what I mean is like the they're not even totally recreating their motors and engines right away. Like a lot of the first planes that fly, maybe by the time of the first world war, we've gotten a little more sophisticated. But some of the first planes that are going to fly, I guess, a couple years after the Wright brothers started doing their thing, you're literally going to see planes driven by actual car engines and car motors. Like mm -hmm. they're not redesigned to be plane engines yet. It's just you know insert. Uh, engine A into new thing B. Um, so I guess maybe at this point, would it be fair to say we've started to build some 
aircraft specific engines uh, and motors at this point. Now this uh, this is a late war photograph. Okay. So yes, I yeah. would definitely okay. say so. Cool. Um, what's fascinating if you if you're looking for a contemporary example of these R series Zeppelin bombers. Um, the comic book movie Wonder Woman a few years back. Ooh. The first Wonder Woman movie um, has one of these in it. It's the big plane during the end sequence, and they actually do a really good job showing what they look like. I got to watch that again, because I just remember I feel like that Wonder Woman just won the whole First World War by herself, <laughs> and I don't think that's how that happened. Not quite. But again, by the end of the war... We've gone from the from grenades and bricks out of the side of the plane and little twenty pound bombs to twenty four hundred pound pieces of ordnance that, that are being a, carried and dropped. For, <laughs> it looks like an an ICBM that looks like a nuclear missile. <laughs> uh twenty four hundred pound bomb. Mm-hmm. So we have the air power, and I don't mean the firepower, but the strength uh, and lift to get stuff that heavy off the ground and to fly it for said distance correct unbelievable we're talking 11 to 15 years after the first time we flew balsa wood yep this is incredible the experimentation and the science behind the air war is fascinating by how fast everything is moving and we hear accounts of this of of things going from paper to physical aircraft in 14 months 12 months sometimes less than a year incredible it is it really is um, and of course, by the end of the war, we do have some of the mainstays of what we would see in 20th century warfare with multi-engine bombers, long-range bombers, things of this nature. And of course, bombers that can carry huge ordnance. I can't payloads. get over this picture. Like, it's going to sound like I'm just promoting the YouTube to promote it, but like, get over there and watch it. Look at this thing. It's, that thing is twice the size of that guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He looks thrilled to be standing next to it, by the way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's like, thanks for putting me next to this massive bomb. (laughs) (laughs) Why are you smoking? (laughs) Don't worry about it. So while this is going on, we're also going to start to see the escalation of what becomes known as scout or pursuit aircraft, which will be the beginnings of fighter aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. And... Now I can start the top gun. Either. Right, exactly. Okay, let's go. So this is where we'll start to see the escalation period, and one of the guys we have to talk about is, of course, Anthony Fokker. Let's go. Um, born in the Netherlands, Fokker was a tinker from a young age, and he had been bored by school. He was one of these guys who was probably too smart for school. Uh, he cheated his way through examinations using a device of his own design to basically figure out the answers for him. Wait, is that too smart for school if you're cheating? Well, he figured out a workaround for all of the standardized testing. All right. Or okay. early forms of standardized testing. Because I, too, was too smart for school, but I could never <laughs> cheat through things like that. Now, he is going to go into several failed business ventures. Fokker becomes enamored with flight. After these early uh, ventures don't work out, and he attempted to build several different aircraft with several different financial backers in the years leading up to World War I. By 1911, he had his pilot's license, so he was trying to build planes before he even had a license, okay? as a lot of these guys were doing. I think the Wright brothers would be a good example of that. Because who are the license holders? Exactly. Like, <laughs> what? But by 1911, he does have a pilot's license, and he is going to win a 250-mile airplane course. Um, That's what we see a lot of in these early aerial competitions. It's less about speed and more about endurance. How far can you go? So 250-mile airplane race, uh, Fokker's going to win that, and that's going to give him enough liquid funds, if you will, to set up his own flying school. And he is going to do this for the German government at Mecklenburg. He formed a new airplane company and began to design and build for Germany at this time. Now, there's a very real debate between early combat pilots, between pushers, which we've seen some pushers, and the tractor engines, such as we see here with with Fokker. Um, Because... The real advantage that the tractor planes have over the pushers is that the the weapon is fixed. 
Okay. For a pushing aircraft, the machine gun is sitting on its its mount, and they can move it back and forth and up and down and all this, which sounds great, but it also makes it really difficult yeah. to hit anything. Right. But for a tractor engine, a, a, a plane that has the propeller in the front, the weapon is fixed. And so where you point the plane is where, arguably, the shots are going to go. The problem is, is the propeller. Yeah, I was going to say, how do you shoot through the propeller? Exactly. And that's one of the big things that Fokker is going to work with, with the synchronization gear. And there's a picture of Anthony Fokker there. He looks nothing like Ben Stiller. <laughs> I feel like the tractor concept was the prevailing concept by War's End, because you'll see into the next World War more of the, you know, engines mounted in the front of the planes. Oh, absolutely. And I feel like the pusher concept lends more to the jet propulsion. Mm. Uh, where you'll see jets, mm -hmm. you know, mounted at the sides and rear of the plane, propelling, pushing, propelling. Yeah, that's you a good know, point. Forward, so, yep, that's a good point. But here's a good example of the dangers of fixed weapons and tractor engines. Uh, you can see this propeller has just been completely blown away on one side by its weapon. Yeah, that guy clearly shot himself down. Correct. I mean, this obviously happened in a test place, but. Um, you could, <laughs> you could imagine, right? You're flying and you're like, I got him and myself crap. And, and we do see that during the war. We're going to talk a little bit about that. No. Um, one of the first experimentations with firing through your propeller was done by French pilot Roland Garros. He's still a, he's still a hero there in French <laughs> military history. And what he did was instead of trying to synchronize his fire or try to get between the blades. He just blazed away through his propeller, but put steel deflectors on his propeller blade. So he would have massive amounts of ricochets and sparks, and that will still damage your propeller over Absol time. Absolutely, it will. That's a dumb idea. Well, Garros successfully shot down an enemy plane by firing through his propeller on April 1st, 1915. Two more victories followed, but on April 18th, Garros was forced to land behind German lines. His propeller was examined by Fokker, who was already working on his synchronization gear solution. Okay, so Anthony Fokker himself is going to take Roland Garros's propeller, look at it, and say, yeah, I can do better than that. Uh -huh. <laughs> He's like, interesting. Now, the synchronization gear itself had been experimented with for a long time before World War I. Going back to at least 1910, we have different. Um, designs and patents being put forward to fire through the propeller of an airplane. And here's just a couple of different designs. I mean, that's one from 1910. This is one from 1913 with a rifle instead of a machine gun. But what we're going to land on and what Fokker lands on is what's known as a cam design. He uses a bulging cam wheel that instead of interrupting the actual gunfire, it would only allow the trigger to be activated when the blade is not in the way. How? So, okay. My brain is not very smart right now. I don't... The technology that's just happening here is wild. So it's, it's going to be able to tell this propeller that's spinning at hundreds, potentially, of miles an hour when it's not in the way of the barrel for that split millisecond, you right. know, make up a mathematical small measurement. That's incredible. It is. And it's it's all because of this wheel here. Okay. All right. This what's known as a cam wheel. It's a bulging cam wheel. And basically you can hold down on the trigger of that machine gun the whole time. Okay. And get your bursts going. But as that wheel's rotating, it's rotating with the engine. Cool. Say so the drive shaft of the engine is rotating that wheel. And so every time that the propeller is getting to the point where it's going to be in front of the muzzle of that machine gun, this thing is not allowing the bullets. Do we see a lot of jamming because of how fast this process works? We do see jamming. And in fact, the examining of one's um, bullets becomes almost a religious thing for a lot of these pilots because they need to make sure there is no sort of um, malformation or any sort of issues with any of the bullets going into their weapons because they do jam so easily. Interesting. This is awesome. Now, 
almost every country in the war is going to develop its own version of this, but Fokkers is probably the one, it's not probably, it is the one that'll be put into mass production first. Now, with the development of the interrupter gear, or the synchronization gear, as it's also known, this is going to lead to what's known as the Fokker scourge, which would be the first real period of air dominance by Germany during the First World War, from August 1915 to about March of 1916. Pilots are now able to point their plane at their target and fire through their propellers reliably. Germany has a huge advantage due to this, ushering in the Fokker scourge and the era of the true fighter pilot. Max Immelmann, one of the early German aces, was known as the Eagle of Lille due to his aggressive defense of that city's airspace. Immelmann flew against British and French flyers throughout the scourge, ranking up 17 victories prior to his death in June of 1916. His death is still debated to this day as to what actually happened, and there are some who suggest that he had some sort of issue with his synchronization gear and shot himself down. Oh. By taking his own propeller off. Unintentional. Right. Now, Immelman is best remembered for what's known as the Immelman turn. And here's an example of that. It's basically what's allowing the plane to almost go up into a full loop-de-loop and come back on an opponent. But that's probably what he's best remembered for, for these early fi- this early fighter period. We see this a lot in really dramatic chase scenes in these early fighters. Right, exactly. We see it in even in World War II movies where there's a fighter chasing another fighter, and they, they're racing to the sky towards the sun, and then one dude just, like cuts the engine, pulls back, and, like, does this, like, really tight loop over and kind of retraces their steps and, like, flips over the guy at the last second. It's exactly what we're looking at here. Yep, exactly. Now... Sick move, though. Much like we were talking about during our SOM uh, episode with Rob Enfield, the response is going to be coming from the Allies as well. Rob was talking about how... Every time there was any sort of advantage made by the Allies on the ground, there would be a German response or an Austrian response. We see this happening in the skies as well. The Allied response to the Fokker scourge is going to be what's known as the Newport. And Newport 11, known as the Bebe, and the Newport 17, the Super Bebe. Super Bebe. Not to be confused with your bay. Right. That's the dumbest expression ever. It's totally irrelevant. We'll never talk about it on this show again. But if you say Bay, stop, please. Just stop. Please stop. Though the Newport 11, or the Bay Bay, was at a disadvantage due to its lack of synchronization gear, you'll notice that it has its, its, mount, its yeah. weapon mounted on the, on the wing above. The larger Newport 17, or the Super Bay Bay, was introduced in March 1916 and initially armed with an overhead Lewis gun like the original had, as well as a Vickers gun mounted behind the engine. So it's it's packing two two guns guns? initially, yes. One for each of them. Yep. The British had a response of their own in the form of of a pusher aircraft, the Airco DH-2. And I love these little things. Yeah, that's nifty looking. Yeah. But it actually has a an almost fixed weapon in the front there on the naysail. This is a fighter plane? That's a fighter plane, yep. That looks like one of those big clunky bomber reconnaissance things. It does look a little bit like it. I mean, just, just maybe it's the angle of the picture we got here, but it definitely doesn't look like it's super maneuverable. Right. The wings are cool. Now, it's going to be introduced in February of 1916 and proved to be superior to the Eindecker in both speed and especially climb. So. Weird looking, yeah. but a superior aircraft. Yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. We're also going to see the Farnham Experimental Number 2, uh, sometimes known as the Fighting Experimental. British two-seater that helped end the German air superiority over the Somme in 1916. This pusher was very heavily armed. Like all pushers, it was very vulnerable to attacks from the rear because it has this massive engine in the back. Uh, This is actually known as a gun bus, was its uh, nickname. That thing is, it's massive. Do they, 
cover the skeleton framing with canvas for flight, or is that all open like that? It's all open like that. Cool. Because the engine, you see, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. the propellers back there. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> now, according to Frederick Libby, the first United States World War I ace, the gun in front of the naysail was, quote, covered a huge field of fire forward. Between the observer and the pilot, a second gun was mounted for facing over the FE-2B's upper wing to protect the aircraft from rear attack. Adjusting and shooting this gun required that you stand right up out of the naysail with your feet on the naysail coning. Like, like, You've got to stand up in that that's what I was gonna and say. step up onto that ledge. No, thank you. No. That's almost as bad as being in a ball turret in the next war. No thanks. Yeah. Now, now that we're starting to develop actual fighter aircraft, in 1916, we're going to see a year of reorganization by both sides, the Allies and the Central Powers, and the days of the gentlemen's duels in the sky or sport in the air is coming to an end. The air service of all combatants are now going to turn to the grim reality of warfare and lethal fighter organizations. And we're going to see the developments of aero squadrons and Jastas at this point. The pursuit aircraft or the fighter squadron is going to be developed. And the first fighter squadron or true fighter squadron that we will see in Germany were known as Kex. And the Kex squadrons were... Camp Feinsteiser Commando. There's a picture of some of the early Keck fighters. The squadron tactics for these early fighter squadrons were actually developed by Oswald Bolke. Germany's first ace, Bolke helped guide the reorganization of the German air service in 1916 with the development of the Keck fighter groups and later the, Jast- the Jagstaffels or Jastas. Bolka was killed following a mid-air collision and crash landing in October of 1916. Now, this is a very unsafe time to fly ex- in the history. Like extremely. everybody, even the experts are dying. Yes, this is an extremely <clears throat> unsafe time. But he is going to develop the rules of aerial combat known as the Dicta Bolka. I'm and sorry, the what? Dicta Bolka. Oh, okay, okay. This is a family show, Matt. I was going to say, <laughs> mind yourself. So there are seven basic rules that that Bulka developed for aerial combat. And I'll just read those real quick. Rule number one. Always try to secure an advant- advantageous position before attacking. Rule number two. Try to place yourself between the sun and the enemy. Rule number three. Do not fire until within range and squarely in sights. Number four. Attack when the enemy least expects it. Rule number five. Never flee from an enemy fighter. That's a good one. Don't flee. That just makes you look bad. Rule number six. Keep your eye on the foe. And then number seven. Rule number seven is the most important one. Acts of foolish bravery only bring death. Looking at you, Maverick. (laughs) We're talking about a guy who came up through the era of duels in the skies and these early aspects of the war. He saw many a brave pilot on both sides doing these fantastical and and incredibly brave acts only to die as very young men because of it. Is this kind of like a know your limits? Like you can be a hotshot, but like no one to quit the field and fight like just. I think that's exactly what it is. Get your vanity. He's one of those guys. I think that's exactly what it is. Now, the Augstaffel, or the Jastas, as they were were later known, is going to be the big German fighter groups. And this is where we're going to get things like fighter wings, like the Flying Circus. And we'll touch on that more in a little bit. Now... One of the aspects that I'm sure that our listeners are curious about is something that Hollywood's made a movie out of, okay? Um, of course, the film Flyboys, which is not particularly good in its historical accuracy. But, but it's such a good movie, It though. was still a lot of fun to watch, especially <laughs> for an, a period when we didn't have a lot of World War I movies. Right. Um, they're really trying to follow the Lafayette Escadrille, Okay. The problem is, is that they mixed the Lafayette Flying Corps and the Escadrille history, which is not terribly difficult to do, but they didn't really 
try to separate the two. Yeah, like one is a big unit and one is like a smaller group of flyers in that overall unit. Right. So we focused on the small group. Right. Now, the Lafayette Flying Corps was also known as the Franco-American Flying Corps. <laughs> Um, this was a paper organization, okay, because Germany got pretty ticked off when they heard about this idea of American flyers when America was yet to be in the war. And so it got its name changed to the Lafayette Flying Corps, a uh, paper organization of a list of approximately 200 Americans that flew for France in World War I. Is Lafayette's significance the historical Franco-American significance? Yes. Like Marquis de Lafayette? Correct. Sweet. That's exactly right. Now, we do have, of those 200 pilots that fly for France, about 180 of them will see combat. And there are images of these guys. Again, this is all pre-Escadrille. This is all pre-American involvement. The Lafayette Escadrille, or the Lafayette Squadron, is very specific from this group. That It existed from April 16, 1916 to February 18th of 1918, and was made up of 38 Americans and four French pilots. It accounted for 57 enemy aircraft being shot down before it was disbanded and reorganized into the American Expeditionary Force as the 103rd Aero Squadron. So you may be familiar with the chief's head design on a lot of aircraft. That's them. They're the 103rd. All right. Now we're coming into uh, a time of the war that I focus heavily on. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I am, you know, it's no secret if you've been listening along, I follow a Canadian unit, the 85th Highlander uh, Battalion. Their job is to basically secure Hill 145 when they're called upon as reserves during the Battle of Vimy Ridge, which is the opening of the Battle of Arras. And what's happening above them is one of the most dramatic moments in the sky of the First World War. Matt, I'm talking about Bloody April. Um, Take us through uh, basically, I'd say, April and May of 1917. And take us wherever you want to go. But I'd say that's, it kind of bleeds into May. I don't know why. I don't know why they only call it Bloody April. May is pretty, pretty nasty too. It absolutely does. Um, And we're going to touch on those losses because you're absolutely right, Pat. In the spring and summer of 1917 is known as Bloody April and the Gotha Summer. So the Battle of Arras, as you mentioned, April 9th, April 9th, excuse me, 1917, the British first and third armies attacked the Germans at Arras in an attempt to take Vimy Ridge which they succeeded in doing, and to support the French Neville Offensive, which was kicking off 50 miles south of Arras. Initial success at Arras eventually petered out to a bloody stalemate in mid-May. This massive offensive on the ground was supported from the air by the aggressive tactics of Brigadier General Hugh Trenchard, known as Boom Trenchard in the British military. British airmen, however, ran right up against Manfred von Richthofen and Jasta Eleven. The Royal Flying Corps lost 316 pilots and observers in that one month from March to May. 1,270 aircraft were lost during this period. So we have now name-dropped for real one of the most famous fighter pilots of the First World War, Rick Tofen, uh, the actual Red Baron, not the pizza maker. Um, <clears throat> and we've talked about um, how many the British... Uh, planes, I'm sorry, how many British planes were lost uh, semi-immediately, I guess, you know, through most of April. Um, Richthofen has 80, 88 kills, I think, as a career total. Do we know? I think it's a straight 80. Do we know how many he's going to come into April of 1917 with? Off the top of my head, I don't. Uh, But what's interesting is, is that um, the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, is best known for the tri-wing uh, Fokker, that's not the v- that is not the machine that he makes most of his kills in. Interesting. Yeah, he actually does most of his kills in an Albatross, which is an earlier aircraft two, design. Two-wing plane? It is. Yep. And we're going to touch on those uh, those tri-wings because they're not German in, in originally. All right, well, let's talk about Rick Tofen and Josta 11 a little bit. Yep. So the Flying Circus, let's talk a little bit about this. Jagdschwader 1 was a German fighter wing under the command of Rick Coffin following the success of Josta 11 in the spring of 1917. Made up of Jostas 4, 6, 10, and 11, the wing was shipped by train up and down the front to achieve aerial superiority where it was most needed. Ooh, 
Ooh, so they don't even have a static, like, flight area. Correct. So they're, that's awesome. So they're moving the squadron itself. And it's a whole flight, so it's four different squadrons. That's yep. awesome. Now, painted in bright colors and often set up in tents on improvised airfields, the fighter wing gained the name Richthofen Circus or the Flying Circus because circuses were often transported by rail at this time. The Flying Circus was also the first German fighter group to test the Fokker DR-1, or, as we were just discussing, the triplane. Now, Jagdfader 1, the Flying Circus, is going to dominate the air uh, over Arras for the spring of 1917, but we're also going to see during the summer of 1917 the, what's known as the first blitz. Mm. Aerial raids on London had been occurring via Zeppelin since 1915 to a limited degree of success. By 1917, however, we're going to have an increasing number of massive airships. Large twin-engine bombers also begin to take their place of these airships. Starting in May and lasting through the summer, Gotha bombers led daylight raids on England, initially gaining success for the same reasons the Zeppelins had originally. In other words, they could get higher than the anti-aircraft guns. Okay, Their ceiling was just so much better than the fighter aircraft or any anti-aircraft guns on the ground. All told, the Gothas carried, about, carried out about 27 raids, killing 835 people while injuring at least 2,000. Poor weather and winter helped England, though, see the end of this series of raids. I love that propaganda poster. It's better to face the bullets than be killed at home by a bomb. Yeah, can't be killed at home by a bomb if you're out fighting in the war. <laughs> right. And again, there's one of those big Gotha bombers. Now... While all of this has been happening, we have had multiple years of war at this point. Where's the United States? Punitive expedition. We already touched on it. Were you paying attention? There's a test at the end of this episode, right. everybody. We gave, we're the teachers that give you the answers. We already gave you this one. And that was in 1916. That's right. Now, American air power at the time that we entered World War I in the spring of 1917 was 55 aircraft. Wow. Yeah. Pershing said of these 55, 51 were obsolete, and four were about to be. So were they just not paying attention to what was happening in Europe? It wasn't being properly funded. Okay. Okay. Uh, the air service is tied into the Signal Corps at this time, and it's just not something that's being funded. Right. And we're going to see that change, but at this point in time, it's, it's not looking good. Now, the United States were entirely unprepared for wartime production of aircraft. Of the 366 aircraft ordered in 1916, only 64 were delivered. The aviation section of the Signal Corps had a mere 131 trainee pilots and 1,087 enlisted men. Only 26 officers were thought to be fully trained at this time. Military aeronautics up to this point had not been a congressional priority. That, however, is going to change with what was known as the Ribbit Program. On May 24, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson received a cable from French Premier Alexandre F. Ribbit pro proposing that the U.S. plan to send 4,500 planes, 5,000 pilots, and 50,000 mechanics to the front by the spring of 1918. This proposal became the basis of the U.S. aeronautical program. And the man who's going to be championing this is Lieutenant Colonel William Mitchell. Bill Ooh, that's a name we've already talked about this season on the show. Yep, Billy Mitchell. Now, two months later, $64 million was passed by Congress for air airplane production and expansion, the largest appropriation of funds for a single purpose up to this date. 345 combat squadrons, 81 supply squadrons, 11 repair squadrons, and 45 construction companies, along with 26 balloon companies, were authorized. So that is a massive, massive buildup that we're going to see. 
Unfortunately, <laughs> by December 1917, <laughs> aircraft production was way behind schedule. The original number of requested aircraft squadrons was parred down to 202 squadrons by July 1st of 1919. Wow. But only 45 squadrons were on the front by November 11th, 1918. Now, there was no American-made planes that made it to the front in World War I. Okay? So and everything we're flying as American pilots are made by England or France? Correct. Okay. What the United States does have is the Curtis JN4 Jennies. Um, there's some fairly famous stamps out there that have the Jenny on them, included the, the famous inverted Jenny because it was stamped upside down. Now, is this the Jenny or the Jenny? Cute. <laughs> They're going to be trainee planes, okay, used as trainers. But America's real production achievement during World War I for aircraft is going to be the Liberty engine. Right. By November 11th, 1918, 13,574 engines had been produced, and U.S. Factory, factories were cranking out about 150 of these bad boys a day. And we're shipping these, obviously. Overseas. Overseas on boats like the Lusitania. <laughs> exactly. I don't now, know. I don't know specifically that there were engines aboard there, just to be very clear. There might have been. There probably were. But I, I don't know that. And then we're not saying that definitively right now. But on ships like it. Right. Now, one of the great campaigns that the United States is really involved in in the air would be the Samuel Offensive in September of 1918. And I've done quite a bit of reading on this offensive, and it's fascinating. Samuel was not the American Expeditionary for Force's first engagement in World War I. No. We know that. What it was, was the first time U.S. troops will lead an offensive. In this case, to cut off the Samuel salient, besides the American First Army and the French Second Colonial Corps, the U.S. Air Service also took the lead. And we can see here the salient on this wartime map and they're going to try to pinch that off. All right. So we're going to have a combined air force of American, United Kingdom, French, and Italian planes numbering 1,481 aircraft, the largest wow. concentration of Allied air power thus far in the war, and will, it will all be under the command of Colonel William Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell! <laughs> um, wow, that's, that's a lot of planes. For, I mean, in any era. It's a ton of planes. It absolutely is. And what's going to happen is, is that we're going to have some extremely terrible weather, but due to advances on the ground, but also due to striking well behind German lines by the air, the air power at the time, we would see an, a significant success. And I just wanted to read this quote from the memoir of Eddie Rickenbacker himself. Ooh, Rickenbacker, another famous flyer. Exactly. America's f most famous ace out of World War I. He would command the 94th Aero Squadron, the Hat and the Ring Gang. Um, and he wrote about the Samuel uh, offensive. The Samuel drive was on. Leaping out of bed, I put my head outside the tent. We had received orders to be over the lines at daybreak in large formations. It was an exciting moment in my life as I realized that the great American attack upon which so many hopes had been fastened was actually on. At 60 feet above the ground, flying straight east to Samuel, we crossed the Meuse River and turned down its valley toward Verdun. Many fires were burning under us as we flew, most of them on the German side of the river. Villages, haystacks, ammunition dumps, and supplies were all being set ablaze by the retreating Huns. One American army was pushing towards it from the point just south of Verdun, while the other attack was made from the opposite side of the salient. Like an irresistible pincers, the two forces were drawing nearer and nearer to their objective point. We found the Germans in full cry to the rear. So this is going to be an overwhelming success. Now, that is due in large part to the fact that the Germans were already pulling out of the Samuel salient. Right. They had recognized the danger of their position, but it's a huge boon to the Allies and specifically to the Americans for having led an offensive themselves 
to a success, and it's going to lead right into the 100 days and the end of the war. Yeah, and we have some big names in American military history fighting down there, like George Patton, you know, famous for the Second World War, is wounded Mm -hmm. in this campaign and in the most Patton of Patton things, while wounded, doesn't quit the field, finds a foxhole, and continues to conduct his command. Uh, It's pretty interesting. There's a lot going on here. Uh, And like Matt said, it definitely is going to bring us right to the beginning of the the immediate end of the war here. Right. So let's take a little bit of a look at the armistice and the cost of this. So the 11th month, the 11th day, the 11th hour of 1918, the guns will go silent across Europe. Armistice is signed, and Germany will surrender. Now, for the big three, France, England, and Germany, the losses in the air were staggering. France had produced 67,987 aircraft over the course of four years of war and had lost 77% of them. Wow, that's staggering. The British had produced 58,144 and lost 62%. Germany, for its production, had produced 48,537 planes in four years and lost 57%. Now, we do have to realize the vast majority of these losses are due to training and accidents and things of that nature, but staggering losses on all sides. And the importance of air power has been realized. And one of the results of this would be Article 198 in the Treaty of Versailles that would state specifically that the armed forces of Germany must not include any military or naval air forces. Now, there has been some very good historians who have suggested that this would actually lead to a boon for the Germans when they begin to rearm. They don't have to try to utilize any old aircraft or old designs, and they are able to develop newer aircraft, aircraft that are better prepared for what becomes World War II than the Allies had initially. And I think there's some potential truth to that. Now, looking at the results of the war, we are going to have the collapse of four empires. Of course, Germany, Russia, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire are going to collapse in World War I. We would see the rise of the United States on the world stage. You can say it. The beginnings of the rise of the American Empire. Yeah, the American Empire, which has already begun, um, and the beginning of what's sometimes referred to as the American century, yep. the 20th century. Uh, The toll, of course, would be staggering. Approximately 24 million casualties are going to occur. And then, of course, the influenza, or the plague of 1918, is going to sweep across this brutalized Europe and world, leading to another 54 million deaths. Yeah. It was not a good time to be alive. Uh, Pinker's curve, I think people might have argued with it at that time. Hmm. Um, Matt, the air war is, is one of those things that I don't think we'll ever truly understand as far as its outright significance in the scope of the first world war, because we spend so much time in academia focused on the guns of the war, the mud of the war, the wire, the gas. And while we do have a number of brilliant historians from yourself to a number of notable other ones writing about this topic, I fear that it's just one of those, it gets further and further into obscurity and we know less and less. And I actually, that's why I liked the James Franco film so much because it was a moment to look at it. It wasn't just looking at the air war, but it was looking at America's involvement in French uniforms. Like it's a really weird 
sort of introduction to how we participated in one of the most major global events at the time and how we participated before America officially got involved. Um, anyway, we could talk about that another time. Air War, if you want to hear about what we think about some historical movies, <laughs> you're going to have to tune in to like season five at this point. But tune in nonetheless. We've been kicking around some ideas. But Matt, uh, I thank you for sharing this with me, man. I know that I've seen this, this program uh, in bits and pieces here and there over the last year or two. Um, and I know you're really proud of it. And you should be. This was incredible. Uh, it was deep. It was thorough. And it flowed really well. The, um, the favorite thing that I think I took away from this was just the... Uh, the amount of innovation that takes place in a short amount of time. Right. Um, just for context, one thing we're not talking about is some things that's going to happen like 50 years later, I don't know, called the moon landing. Hmm. But what we have in terms of a 66 year period of time in that regard, is we go from the Wright brothers to Neil Armstrong and, and in a shorter window, we go from the Wright brothers sticks and paper minute long flights to a decade just a decade later mm -hmm. you know it is revolutionizing a battlefield in a way that you know we were only dreaming of a generation or two before with the guys like thaddeus Lowe and and before um and i think that that is absolutely mind-blowing uh as far as just a technological progress and i think the whole 20th century um should be looked at in that just for humanity, mm -hmm. what we were able to technologically advance in simply just a hundred years air. This program is a great example of that because we're talking about going from nothing to full blown air corps and divisions and squadrons. And then 50 years after this, we're on the moon. Right. And that brings me to the rest of this episode. We need to go back to the moon, Matty B. That's it's a stump <laughs> speech for the moon. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't have well, any the, really parting shots for that. You want to talk about the moon? Let's go. Well, I was just going to say, they're, they're prepping for it. The Artemis flight is going to be unmanned, but it's going to be the next big mission to the moon. I did see that. And that's actually, you know, it's fortuitous that we'll close out on this because I did see the article the other day that they were rolling the, the rocket to the launch pad. And I was like, I forgot that this is a project we are actively working on again. And I'm, I'm weirdly getting excited for, you know, space things. Like, we're you know, going back. Yeah, we're going back to the moon. I think we're looking at Mars yep. next. And, you know, I've, one of the things I've been critical of humanity of is like, what, do we get to the moon is just decide that was good enough? <laughs> like, what are we doing? We need, as, as a one humanity, I think it made sense for us to all sort of pull in the same direction and look to the skies. And this seems like we're, you know, with all the crap happening around us, it'd be a good time to start looking up again. Um, well, the guys on the Western Front spent a lot of time looking up, uh, wondering what was happening above them because they grew up in, in worlds where they didn't see planes like this. They might have heard about the balloons of war. They might have seen, uh, you know, some of the novelty balloons at, at fairs and things like that. But, you know, as the men of the 85th Highlanders, for instance, you know, just to bring it all home, uh, were spending their nights, you know, on the slopes of Vimy Ridge, they were listening to and seeing uh, the bloody April battle uh, waging above, raging above them, and it was changing everything that we'll know about warfare in the next war, and the one after that, the one after that, the one after that. Uh, Matty B., thank you so much for sharing this with us, man. I don't have any parting shots uh, to get out of here on. I think that you crushed this, and, uh, and I hope that our listeners enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, take us home, Matt. Well, it's just a, a pleasure to speak to our listeners about this topic. It's something that I've been passionate about for a while. And again, it's an area of, of World War I history that I felt that I could actually engage with because it is a much smaller aspect of the war, and it has allowed me to dive in deeper on the rest of World War I, and I encourage all of our listeners who are interested in this very important period and often overlooked period of history to engage with. Yeah, get it, in it. It sets, it sets the stage for the rest of the 20th century. What do we say? Jump down the rabbit hole. That's right. Jump down it, folks. All right, well, as we get out of here, you can follow the History Things Podcast on all of our social media, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram by searching for the History Things Podcast. You can follow Matt and I on our independent solo historical uh, journeys and adventures. You can follow Matt on Instagram at, uh, at Matt Borders Books. I don't know why I always stumble over that because the I could say you can follow at and then a second at, and it just it just grammatically feels weird. You can follow Matt at at Matt Borders Books on Instagram, and you can follow myself on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as well at at History Things with Pat. Send us an email at History Things Podcast at gmail.com. Questions, comments, compliments, concerns, all that. 
Uh, Matt and I both manage the account personally, so if you send us a message, you will get us directly, and you will be handled accordingly. Um, and if you're looking for ways to help the show, if you've been hanging out with us for three seasons and, uh, and you're looking for ways to help us grow and reach even more listeners, we would be super appreciative of that. Every little bit helps us uh, get out there more, spreading the signal. So on your favorite podcast app, please make sure to hit the five-star rating button, leave us a positive review, uh, and just share the podcast with your friends. You know, not everybody uh, knows that, you know, podcasting is a, is a place you can go to both have fun and learn. Uh, at the same time, we are trying to pioneer amongst with a, a multitude of our colleagues a new kind of classroom. Uh, and so that is something that, you know, we, we believe a lot about is that you guys are a big part of helping us do that. So, you know, spread the signals, share our show with whoever. And, uh, you know, whoopie pies were invented in uh, Pennsylvania. All right. For the air war above the Western Front, for my co-host, Matt Borders, I am your co-host, Pat McGuire, you've been listening to the History Things podcast saying we will catch you next time. See you later. Have a good night. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show.